a special welcome to the members of the American Pilgrims on the Camino. Thank you for coming. I would like to apologize in the name of the Minister of Culture of the Galician Regional Government, Mr. Roberto Varela, who unfortunate could, unfortunately could not be with, with us this morning to welcome you and introduce this Sunday at Met. I also apologize for my pronunciation. I hope that my speech is clear. Due to its historical and spiritual importance, the St. James pilgrimage route to, to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela represents a milestone in the evolution of the Western culture, a thousand-year-old link between the different European peoples that became pilgrims during the Middle Ages and worked towards Galicia in the northwest of Spain. According to ancient tradition, the discovery of the tomb of the Apostle St. James the Great took place in the beginning of the 9th century in a remote corner of the northeastern Spain. Around this tomb, a cathedral was built and a city slowly emerged with the purpose of housing the sacred relics attending the requirements of the worshippers of St. James and adequately preparing for the arrival of pilgrims who, even as early as the 10th century, arrived in Locus Santi Jacobi for other cities in the Christian in Spain and from the rest of Europe. In the course of time, most of the scattered lands of the West were able to be established relationships thanks to these pilgrimage routes and to their infrastructure, which provided assistance and places for devotion and contemplation. The pilgrimage route of St. James has thus been crucial for the construction of the European identity. Jerusalem and Rome had been the two main pilgrimage destinations during the first centuries of Christianity, and Santiago de Compostela will become the most important destination of medieval pilgrimage. During this fruitful age, in which pilgrims were driving by their faith and by the motivation of the numerous indulgences they could obtain if they, completed the if they complete the pilgrimage to Santiago, the monarchs of the time built and protected the way. They built bridges, hospitals, and churches, and encouraged the foundation of the new towns and cities that organized themselves around the main road, the pilgrimage route itself. Similarly, the need for a larger and safer temples promoted the great spread use of the Romanesque architectural style along the pilgrimage route. At the end of the Middle Ages, the papacy helped promote the pilgrimage to Santiago in a unique way through the establishment of a, period holy, a periodic holy year celebrated on those years when July 25th, the day of the Apostle, falls on Sunday, as has been ca the case of this year 2010. European pilgrimages to the Cathedral of Santiago were the spontaneous and popular result of a civilization motivated by the strength of its faith, driving by its search of spirituality and by its need to find meaning to a life they, will, they knew to be ephemeral and circumstantial. People's religious mentality during the Middle Ages with regard to Latin Christianity, which stayed for religious, religious images and miraculous sacred places, laid the foundation and made it possible for, for pilgrimages to Santiago. It is evident that the pilgrimage to Santiago evolved into an excellent means for the exchange of ideas that helped de develop the identity of Europe throughout the last centuries and which continues to be used to encourage intercultural dialogue and promote diversity among cultures. Perhaps the most noteworthy thing about the way of St. James as initiator of the culture and thought it is continued survival in the present at the beginning of the, of the 21st century because it continues to be living historical phenomenon that still amazes the world with its popular appeal and mass gatherings such as we saw last week in Santiago when during the visit of the Pope to Galicia as universal pilgrim. 
the deep religious and cultural meaning of the pilgrimage route to Santiago as one of the, pillar, of the pillars of European identity has been highlighted by international institutions on several occasions. It was acknowledged by the Council of Europe as a cultural route in, 19, in 1987, and in 1993, the UNESCO declared it at World Heritage. Also, in 2004, the Way of St. James was granted by, by the Prince of Asturias Award to Concord, which, if possible, depends on the most intimate message to the experience of the Jacobean route, to offer a time, the duration of the pilgrimage, and a place, the route itself, as a space with a special meaning where solidarity, meditation, and dialogue are still possible. Um, if the pilgrimage is the route and Santiago is the destination, the Sacobeo Public Company, of which I have the honor to be the managing director, is the tool created by the Galician regional government at the beginning of the 90s to manage and promote everything related to the way of St. James. Our main objective is to care for, protect and promote the Jacobean pilgrimage route, the conservation and maintenance of more than 1,300 kilometers of different routes to make up the pilgrimage in the, re in the region of Galicia, as well as the creation and management of a network of, or more, of more than 60 public hostels that can accommodate more than 3,000 pilgrims. Throughout the Sacobeo Public Company, Galicia is developing a project focused mainly on the culture and cultural tourism as the perfect complement to the religious phenomenon that is the thousand-year-old pilgrimage to the tomb of the Apostle. This holy year, 2010, Sacobeo has outlined a promotional, cultural and touristic project that is centered on the Jacobean tradition and on the pilgrimage route to Santiago. It has an open nature, which is transparent to the contemporary, to the contemporary culture, it is deeply contemplative and fully respects the past and the spiritual values that underlie this event. During the 12 months of this year, there have been and will continue to be throughout the year, historic and contemporary exhibitions, conferences and seminars, festivals and concerts, sports, theater and dance. More than 2,000 events and activities in a total of 12 countries around the world that have already attracted more than 4 million people. The tourism data available to us in Galicia, now that we have, but sorry, that now that we are with winding up the Compostela Holy Year 2010, seem to indicate that our efforts have paid off. This year, Galicia has broken many of its previous records with respect to the number of tourists, visitors and pilgrims, with more than 8 million visits to Galicia this year. The same is true in terms of the participation to the world range of cultural and artistic events programmed by the Sacobeo Public Company. As part of this cultural program, Sacobeo collaborated on a very special film a Spanish-American co-production about the contemporary experience of the pilgrimage to Santiago. It is called The Way, starring Martin Sheen and directed by his son, Emilio Estevez, who have Galician ancestors. The world premiere was held last week in Spain, as soon it will be, re it will be released in the US. The Holy Year ends on December 31st, this year, but our aim is for Galicia to continue to be the spiritual and cultural center of the world in 2011, because we will be celebrating the 800th anniversary of the consecration of the Cathedral of Santiago, one of the most important monuments in Spain's artistic heritage. Construction of the Romanist Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela began in 1075, and it was solemnly consecrated by Archbishop Pedro Muñiz in April 1211. Eight centuries later, here in New York, at the Metropolitan Museum, 
we are presenting a full-scale virtual reality model of the Romanist Cathedral of Santiago, developed by the University of California in collaboration with the Sacobeo Public Company as part of the Compostela 1211 project, directed by Professor John Dagenes, along with John Williams, Fernando Lopez Alcina, and Jose Suarez as co-authors. I would like to thank you all of them for this project, which con coincides with the celebration of with the celebration in 2011 of the of this 800th anniversary of the consecration of the cathedral, a year during which Galicia will once again be the focus of the world's attention with unique with this unique event that we want to transform into a special occasion, a historic a, a historic and a spiritual celebration, but also one of culture and art. We hope to see you there next year, and we'll be glad to share with you our unique country with its extraordinary beautiful architectural, aesthetic, and cultural heritage, with its kind of welcoming people, and with a cultural program that once again will rise to the challenge of the most important spiritual and cultural events in the world. This is no better, there is no better time to visit us if you haven't already done so. No better time to visit Santiago de Compostela and let us welcome you to Galicia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This morning's uh, program is going to be quite exciting and uh, as uh, the director of uh, the Acabeo just indicated, uh, it is a project that's undertaken uh, by the University of California in Los Angeles under the direction of Professor John Gaineth, when he's not wearing his hat as project director for this uh, endeavor. He is professor of Spanish and Portuguese language there. Well, today it, we're going to enter a time machine, turn back the clocks for a thousand years and uh, witness something that's truly remarkable. And, our pilot for this project is Professor DeGaineth and his team. And the structure of the program this morning uh, will run ab about uh, an hour and a half, two hours. And uh, he, his team is going to come back up and down the stage on several occasions. Uh, but I'm going to have Professor uh, DeGaineth introduce uh, the program. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Charente, the Chaco Veo, Ignacio Santos, for uh, that kind introduction, and also for the Chaco Veo support of this phase of the project over the past three years. I'd also like to thank Charles Little and Nancy Wu and all of their staff here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art for their patience and helpfulness as this series and program came, to, came together today. Projects like the reconstruction of the Romanesque Cathedral of Santiago are, by their very nature, collaborative. And so I want to start out at the beginning thanking my co-authors on this project, John Williams, Jose Suarez Otero, and Fernando Lopez Alcina, for sharing their expertise and also for their dedication to ensuring that our work on the Romanesque Cathedral is of the highest scholarly standards. If we ever are sitting together within a th three or four minutes, we're sitting there discussing some problem, as happened just in the green room just now. So uh, it's quite exciting to work with uh, John and Jose and Fernando on this project. Also, uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, Itai Saharovic. Can you wave at everybody? Okay. He's the chief modeler for the cathedral reconstruction uh, these past three years and has uh, really gone beyond just uh, being a, a modeler. He's really made many, many contributions to the quality and the accuracy of this project. Everything you see up there has passed through his fingers at one point or another, and he's also going to help us navigate through the Romanesque model today. As uh, Ignacio Santos mentioned, next April will be the 800th anniversary of the Romanesque stage of the cathedral, uh, it, the consecration of that stage in about 1211. And we're very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, present 
a sort of advanced showing of the model here at the Metropolitan today. Um, just to go through a couple uh, slides I should have gone through a few minutes ago while I was talking. Here, here are our sponsors. Here is the um, team that works on the project, the main team that works on the project. Uh, a few other people are also that aren't here today have made contributions to the reconstruction of the Romanesque Cathedral. And here we have the cathedral as it is today. So our, our project really began with the question, uh, uh, several questions really. Uh, when you go to Compostela today, you see this structure here, this uh, magnificent Renaissance, Baroque, neoclassical cathedral that's monumental in its size and in the urban spaces that have been opened up around it. And uh, we were wanting to know a little more what the, what the experience of an actual a medieval pilgrim uh, who was coming to Santiago de Compostela uh, in, the, in the 12th century perhaps, what they might have uh, perceived, how they might have experienced entering that very different cathedral of 800 years ago. Um, would they have felt as dwarfed as we do by the scale? Probably the Romanesque Cathedral was as monumental for them as, it, as this one is for us. Uh, how did they interact with the spaces in the cathedral? Um, and how did these spaces change over that uh, period in which the cathedral was under construction? Uh, we started trying to answer these questions about 10 years ago using technologies that were, developed, were being developed at UCLA for the reconstruction of cultural sites around the world in three dimensions and in a format that, as you'll see, will allow us to visit the reconstruction in real time, much as the pilgrims would have strolled through the Romanesque Basilica itself. I thought it would take a couple months to do this. Um, here I am, 10 years later. Um, it's been a fascinating and absorbing uh, project for me. Um, I've, uh, in addition to learning a lot, I've made great new friends and colleagues. And uh, so it's, it's quite a pleasure for me to be able to present this here today and uh, to be on the verge of the 800th anniversary of the cathedral itself. But I've also learned, and you've seen if you've come to the other <clears throat> events in this series, that we're just a few of the many, many people who have kind of been captured by the, the quest for the Romanesque Basilica that lies beneath what you see there. It's a, it's a very compelling mystery. Uh, this living building that we uh, see here in its 18th century remodelings, uh, to go there and see it thronged with worshipers today, and to feel that the Romanesque structure is, is, is at once there and not there. That you see pieces of it, um, we have to look for it in the few remaining signs that time has left for us and in some documents and other matters. I'm, this uh, gives you a bit of a history. I think I'm going to move through that because you'll hear these uh, facts multiple times. And I believe I've also discussed the uh, goals of the project pretty well with you. Um, we also are building the medieval town, and in that, Fernando Lopez Alcina is, is helping us, especially in not just the cathedral, but trying to understand it in its urban environment. So these are the kinds of details that we, we study, the, the ways that we try to reconstruct and to understand in new ways the Romanesque cathedral. Um, in details like this, in remarkable figures that appear in the most out-of-the-way places, this uh, <clears throat> up on the exterior of the apse where, where few would ever see it. Sometimes we can see fairly, fairly representative pieces of the Romanesque structure. Uh, this one, though, delightfully overgrown with flowers that have found a place to root in the stone of the basilica. When I say it's a living building, I, I mean it. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Sometimes, though, there are just a few glimpses. We just can barely see what the lower level of the nave, what the windows looked like on the lower level of the nave. We just have this one side and, and the top level, and from that we have to try to understand what the, uh, the entire lower level might have looked like. There's also, I, I've seen over the years of going there, there are just charming details all over in places that uh, very few people would see them. Uh, 
small carvings that you, your eyes fall upon and, and really provide uh, delight as you, as you look at them, as you discover them. Uh, we also can see modifications going on during the 135-year process in which the Romanesque cathedral was brought to completion. Here, uh, this round window was, was punched through fairly early on as a way of letting more light in than the narrow uh, slot of window had provided before. Other times, uh, and this is where it gets to be really fun, it's not clear whether we're looking at a sign of the Romanesque cathedral or not. It's not, it's not clear whether these curves here, which are intriguing enough, illustrate a, a decorated capital that has been eroded by time, or if this is just some accident of uh, erosion uh, of, of the stone itself, some lines that kind of tease our eyes um, and make us think, well, maybe, maybe that's, that's actually a, a decorated capital from the past. Uh, so studying the Romanesque cathedral uh, is something like a reading a palimpsest manuscript where the text has faded, where other texts have been written over it, but where we can still glimpse, if we learn to read it right, the, the beauty, the harmony, and the act of devotion that was the construction of this basilica over those 135 years. I uh, also am not going to go into all of the sources you see listed here one by one. Um, my colleagues will speak about many of them. Uh, no doubt the most important is the, the remaining pieces of the Romanesque church uh, that we see today. Uh, medieval documents, there is a pilgrim's guidebook from the uh, second quarter of the 12th century that describes the cathedral, a history of its most, of uh, Santiago's most dynamic archbishop, Gelmires, and many other, uh, many other uh, documentary archeological sources that my colleagues will talk about. Um, just wanted to show you a few things because <clears throat> in addition to the, those sources, we use old maps, we use sketches, uh, this one from the 17th century, which still may give some clue as to what the Romanesque facade looked like before the magnificent Baroque facade was put in place. Uh, very interesting plans. This is an amazingly accurate plan and elevation of the Romanesque structure made in 1739 in the course of a litigation. Right? So uh, a, a discussion about who owned what, and this was, uh, this plan has come down to us and has helped us in many ways. It yields many surprising details about the Romanesque structure. Also, pieces of the uh, Romanesque structure have found their ways to other parts of the cathedral or to museums, and so we can use those. These, these were pieces of the central arch of the west facade, which you'll, you'll see in just a, in just a moment. Uh, archaeological evidence. Here you can see the, excuse me, go back here. Here you can see the shape of the buttress. This buttress is now buried beneath a, uh, a new room that was built on the side of the cathedral and, and has covered it up, but this has allowed us to know what the shape of these buttresses were, and you can see there how much attention was given even to this portion of the building. And of course, we make our, our own studies. We try to verify uh, what other scholars have done, and uh, this uh, Itai has made, a, as you can see, a very detailed uh, set of measurements of the south facade of the of the current church, which happens to preserve, we believe, the structure of the Romanesque church most accurately. So I'd like to just say a few words about the technical and methodological parts of this. <clears throat> Basically, at any given time, we have two states of the cathedral project. One is uh, the, the current version that's been converted for viewing in, uh, in venues like this, uh, the one we'll see today. And uh, the other one is really where our work is done, where we uh, sit around and discuss, uh, refer to sources, and really together put the, decide what goes where, um, what we need 
to, uh, to work on, what we need to change. Uh, and these are ongoing discussions, uh, very dynamic. Uh, it's very exciting to be able to get the perspective of an historian, an art historian, an archaeologist, and see how our uh, varying pr uh, perspectives come together. Um, this, uh, I, I was about to say, this is a, there are lively discussions. Uh, this picture looks kind of, kind of posed to me, but but I do assure you, um, we have very lively uh, discussions. Uh, so this is from from some years ago, and uh, anyway. Uh, so this brings us to something I'd, I'd like to stress about the nature of our particular reconstruction of the Romanesque church. Um, it's ongoing, it's iterative. We're, we're never, it's never going to be complete. Um, that's not really the goal. We hope to make it more and more accurate, more and more uh, detailed. We've taken this date of April 1211 somewhat arbitrarily as when we could sort of make an end to the Romanesque, uh, this date of the consecration of the Basilica in 1211. Uh, but our work is under constant revision and uh, completion of more details. And again, I want to I stress that it's not our goal to reconstruct the Romanesque Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. What our goal is, is to put together a number of coherent theories concerning what the church may have looked like, how it may have functioned in its urban environment. And um, those of you who are here today and have uh, studied the Romanesque uh, Basilica on your own will no doubt recognize some of the theories that we're testing here, perhaps find some of the new theories that we've advanced in producing our model. And so really this reconstruction seeks to be in dialogue with other scholars, uh, much as a published article or book would try to do. And more, uh, more and more, this is a laboratory. I see this as a laboratory where uh, our ideas and the ideas of other scholars can actually be t tested in a, an extremely accurate model of the architectonic structure of the basilica. We can show multiple solutions to problems at the same time. We can put in contrasting theories and compare them. And I really hope that at this time, uh, the project, we can open it up to other scholars who might want to come and experiment with their own ideas. So uh, it's, a, it's, a way in a, it's a way of advancing arguments, is the way I think we see it uh, more than as a representation of the Romanesque church. And it's a, very, it's a very different type of argument from the ones traditionally made in print. Uh, in print, you can say as a, a particular piece of sculpture went on that facade in that place, and um, th then you're done. But we have to actually put that piece of sculpture on that specific facade in that specific place. And that really challenges many things that have been said about the Romanesque Cathedral when you, when you have to do that. If the sculpture is too big to fit in the space that it's been said it fits in, then we either have to revise our reconstruction we have to move that piece to a location where it actually fits. These are ki the kind of uh, interactive things that, that we do in trying to put this model together. So um, <clears throat> we, we can't get past some difficult issues. We kind of have to put our money where our mouth is in terms of actually placing these, uh, putting together these pieces. Uh, we have to find a solution. If we want our cathedral to have a floor, and we, we really do want it to have a floor, um, we have to talk about, well, what was the floor like? What was it made of? If we want glazed windows, we have to look into Romanesque glass to try to understand from the, the few surviving pieces what it might have been like in this particular building. So um, I, just to give you a sense of this, unfortunately, unfortunately, this slide is a little bit too are not enough high definition to really see it, but our, uh, I'll show you again later on, this is what we call our wireframe. This is a collection of polygons that are used to construct the basic uh, outlines, the basic shape of the Romanesque cathedral. Here we're just experimenting with uh, some previous stages of the, I think this is the uh, 1890, yeah, this is the 899, 
uh, Alfonso III church and a monastic church that stood here as well, uh, just seeing how they relate to the Romanesque structure in order to understand development over time. Sometimes we use published uh, plans to reference what we're doing um, and uh, to uh, kind of get us in the right place, but then everything above the plan is where we have to really uh, bring our sources to bear and to try to understand what, um, what's going on above ground level. Also, again, we can, we can place different structures within the 3D model. We can see what fit where, where something might have stood, what took its place. Again, here we're experimenting with another, uh, with the, the dimensions and earlier dimensions of a chapel that's now much shorter. How did it relate to the Romanesque structure? So, um, as uh, Ignacio Santos has talked about and other people, the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela was a universal phenomenon of the, of the day and of our day. In the Middle Ages, people came from as far away as Greenland on pilgrimages to Santiago. So uh, it's, it's been a major cultural route and from this center has also radiated out uh, art, architecture, ideas as well. The pilgrim, the medieval pilgrim would, uh, if they made it to, to France, would follow probably one of four roads leading from important pilgrimage sites of their own and once in Spain, follow this road across the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, this road that came to be known as the French Road. When, when they arrived in Compostela, and I think it's fascinating that you can see the outline of the medieval town here uh, even today, but the French Road would end ends right about here in a place that's called the Gate of the Road even today, and uh, pilgrims, pilgrims would then follow down through these streets and eventually come to the Romanesque structure of Santiago de Compostela. So now we're going to take a look at the model, sort of pick up where we left off, and uh, talk a little bit about some of the places that we've uh, rebuilt, we've reconstructed in the course of our investigations and we'll kind of alternate, we'll show, show you pieces of the model and then one of my colleagues will speak about some aspect of the work we're doing and then uh, we'll show you a little more and uh, sort of try to alternate that way. So let's go on down to the, to the uh, north door of the, of the model. So this is our uh, idea of um, the medieval town filled with these houses. If you've been to Galicia or Santiago de Compostela, you'll recognize the arcades and the way that um, buildings were uh, built so you can duck in out of the rain or, or whatever. Uh, although stone was not used in those uh, houses or not very much. This building on the right is a, a pilgrim hostel that was built for uh, poor pilgrims. We, and I want to say, I want to point out that some of these buildings, uh, these that don't have windows that are sort of roughed in, these are part of an ongoing project to, to show the urban space and they've been really one of the most interesting parts of uh, understanding the structure in its context and I, be I believe both John and, and Fernando will have uh, things to say about that. When pilgrims would arrive from uh, along the French road, they most often went in this door, the north door. Uh, this happens to be the part of the Romanesque church that is the most changed from, uh, along with the Baroque facade, is the most changed from medieval times. Yeah, let's, let's stop right there for the moment. Um, and so this has been a major effort in reconstruction and trying to understand both the form of the, the architectonic form of the, of the door and also the sculptural program that was on it. Um, in a, our Pilgrim's Guidebook mentions this fountain um, built about 1122, mentions that, I, I don't know, a dozen or so Frenchmen could bathe in it. That was um, the problem being finding a dozen Frenchmen who wanted to bathe. Uh, I, I can say that. I have a French last name. Yeah. Um, in any case, um, yeah, let's take the palace away there too again so we can see. Yeah. Um, so just to show you a little bit about how we 
try to demonstrate our, our various levels of certainty, let's, let's fly up to the, uh, to the facade, to the sculptural reliefs up there. And um, we have a few pieces that have survived. We know pieces that were there from the Pilgrim's Guide and other sources. And in this case, we've tried to give a feeling both for what we have accurately, what we know we have concretely, and let's back up just a little, and what might have been there. So uh, we have this piece. We know from the Pilgrim's Guide that uh, Christ was surrounded by the four evangelists. Only Matthew has survived. Uh, so, but we have taken the form of Matthew and kind of uh, blurred it to, so that we can have an idea of what that might look like if all the pieces had survived. Uh, same thing here, we know there was a sequence of the months of the year. Uh, let's go up and take a look at, uh, we only, only February survives and here he is uh, warming himself by a fire. Probably there was a series of zodiac signs as well. We can see Sagittarius here to give a sense of the cosmos that uh, is uh, part of uh, the meaning of this door. You can also see uh, the creation of Adam and Eve and here uh, God reprehending Adam and Eve and kicking them out of the garden. Uh, a very interesting theme for this particular door. It's seen as the, the penitential door and the north side of the church was associated with penance, with, with the darkness of sin um, and with uh, the movement then of the pilgrim from a state of sin into the cathedral um, where the pilgrimage itself would be complete. And of course, that pilgrimage really began with uh, Adam and Eve taking a, taking a hike. So um, that's, um, that's one of the, the interesting things that, that we'll see and the scholars have studied about this door. So let's, let's back up now and uh, go, go on in and we'll take a look at what, what happens as we as we go into the uh, transept. This column arrangement, by the way, this is uh, our own new reconstruction based on uh, that plan I showed you a little earlier on and on a very similar portal in Toulouse. Uh, we have, it's a very different reconstruction from the ones we've been able to do previously. So I think we'll, we'll go in and take a look at the, uh, just take our first glance at the altar and then I'll ask uh, Fernando to come up. Uh, I, uh, Chuck will come up and introduce Fernando and uh, we will proceed uh, with a little more of our tour then. That's going downstairs. All right. your, your feet are sore, you go rather gingerly down these stairs after, after months on the road. Let's take a look at the altar and then uh, we'll stop there and Chuck will Believe me, you're going to see a lot more of this building in a few minutes. Uh, it'll come back in different forms. Uh, our next speaker, Fernando uh, Lopez Alcina, is professor of medieval history at the University of Santiago de Compostela. And uh, many of his areas of interest include royal and Episcopal offices in, in Santiago itself. Uh, but today he's going, and he knows more about the background of the historical documents uh, of the site. Today he'll be reconstructing the medieval Compostello uh, from the documentary sources. Professor Alcina. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation of uh, John Dagenet to participate in this program that allows me to be here in, with all of you in this session at the Met in New York. I'm going to talk about the Romanesque Cathedral of Santiago and the written sources, not only the, the documentary sources, the cathedral as the, one of the most important um, part of the town. I would like also to apologize for, because of my pronunciation. I hope you understand what I say. In Santiago de Compostela, 
the memory of the Apostle St. James, the Elder, has been venerated since the ninth century. The Episcopal See, which arose there, went through a period of splendor from the 11th to the 13th centuries based on the growing number of pilgrims, the protection of the Castilian Leonese kings, the extension of the jurisdictional dominion, and the frequent relations with the papacy. It was during this remarkable period that the Romanesque cathedral was built between 1075 and 1211, as has been said. Given that the building, despite some partial modification in, in later centuries as we have seen, retains many of its original features, not only is the best source of information about itself, but is also an excellent witness to the time it was built in. Excellent, too, but not unique, because the thriving Episcopal See is also evident in other fields of intellectual and artistic creation, some of whose, some of whose products have also come down to us. These are basically three well-known texts, the Historia Compostelana, the Tumbo A, or the cartulary, the first cartulary of the archive of Santiago, and the Liber Santi Jacobi, or Codex Calistinus. It has been established that these three pieces of very different nature know nothing of each other. And yet, all of the different authors and compilers of these three texts know about the great Romanesque Romanesque cathedral that was being built in Compostela before their very eyes. The new building, where the so-called Apostle of the West was venerated more devoutly than in any other church in Christendom, did not go unnoticed. How do these texts, these texts describe the Romanesque cathedral? of Santiago. What information do they provide us with? To what extent can they help us better understand or recognize what the original parts replaced in later centuries were? Obviously, the answers to these questions are different in each case according to the nature of each text. Let us take a brief look at their main features to start with the Historia Compostelana. You see here the, the oldest manuscript in Salamanca, uh, 13th century. The Historia Compostelana, it's a history of the Church of St. James from the dispersion of the apostles in the first century up to 1139, written as an official record and commissioned by the first archbishop of Santiago, Diego Gelmírez. The oldest part was written in 1110 by a treasurer of the cathedral who combined the story, the narrative section with copies of some 35 documents, mostly paper letters. Based on the technique of the style, we could describe it as a chronicle and a, as a cartulary as well. The most comprehensive and detailed part of the narration and all the documents copied that refer to the period after 1090, when special attention is paid to the figure of Helmirez. The first part was decorated with a miniature showing the discovery of the tomb in the ninth century. The text was continued in two different occasions. The first editions were made in 1124, shortly after a major concession from Pope Callistus II in 1120, when Santiago was declared, uh, was declared our metropolitan see, and Diego Gelmirez was appointed as a papal legate for two ecclesiastical provinces in Spain. The other of this second part, Master Giraldus, 
was a canon in Compostela, although of French origin, who recounted the deeds of Archbishop Diego Gelmirez from 1110 to 1124 and copied a further 60 documents dating back to the same period. The last addition was made by an anonymous author who wrote shortly after Gelmirez's death in 1140. It narrates the events of the years 1124 to 1139 and transcribed another 80 documents. That's the beginning of the third section. The second source is the tumboa, the cartulary that containing 165 royal charters granted to the Church of Santiago from the 9th century to 1255, compiled in successive phases. Initially, it was also an undertaking of Helmírez and the treasurer Bernardo, the same uh, man that made this fountain that we see a couple of minutes ago. The deed that triggered the first part took place in 1127. King Alfonso VII, the nephew of Pope Callistus II, appointed the Archbishop of Santiago as Chancellor and Royal Chaplain and promised that the new Romanesque Cathedral of Santiago would be his burial place. In fact, his father, Count Raymond of Burgundy, had been buried also in the cathedral, in this church. Alfonso VII never was buried in Santiago, but he promised to do it. The archbishop had doubtless found a place in the cathedral at this point to welcome the, royal, the new royal pantheon. We don't know exactly where, but uh, it's a question open where finally was located this uh, pantheon with Ferdinand II and uh, Alfonso IX. From the archbishops of Compostela's new institutional position came it convenience of gathering together the most relevant royal diplomas. A hundred documents were chosen under the needs and the points of view of the time. With more ambitious decoration than the only uh, one single miniature in the Historia Compostelana, the Compostela cartulary reproduces towards 1191, 1129, excuse me, the same miniature of the inventio of the tomb, but it also added the images of 24 donors from King Alfonso II to King Alfonso VII. We see here this, let's say, the, I cannot, maybe. This is the, the, the scene of the discovery with Bishop Teodomirus and the first of the series of the kings. Mm, the cartulary was extended over successive stages with the selective transcription of new documents of Alfonso VII and his successors, Fernando II and Alfonso IX, Fernando III and Alfonso the Wise, together with the images of these four uh, monarchs. Here is Alfonso the Seventh, uh, Fernando II. This is uh, a very interesting piece of uh, documentary evidence, evidence because here this marginal note relates to the royal pantheon some at the beginning of the 13th century, a Capella dos Reis, the royal chapel where Fernando II was buried at the time, obviously in the Romanesque cathedral somewhere. The resulting work reflects a reality. The Church of Santiago was the most favored ecclesiastical institution throughout the kingdom by the monarchy. The third text is the Liber Santi Jacobi. This is the, the last uh, the, uh, signature of, the, of Alfonso the Wise. The next is the Liber Santi Jacobi, the result of several successive compilations which took on a virtually definitive form sometime circa 1140. 
It is closely related to the Romanesque cathedral, as the origins in the, of the Liber Santi Jacobi lie in the introduction of the Roman liturgy in the Church of Compostela in late 11th century. The celebration of the feast day of St. James was set at this time on the 25th of July, but the only other Jacobean feast day, which had been held on December uh, the 30th since the 9th century, was not removed as a result of this change. It was kept. The celebration of, the, of his martyrdom moved to the 25th of July, and the 30th of December remained, in the late 11th century, uh, reserved to the apostolic vocation of Santiago, not to the translation at this point. Shortly after 1105, Helmirez introduced a richer and more solemn liturgy in the Cathedral of Santiago to use on these two feast days. The lectionary, the divine office, and the masses were put together for the 24th of July, the 25th of July, the days infra octava, the 29th and the 30th of December, and the octave. The commemoration of the translation of the body of St. James to Compostela was also added to the feast of the 30th of December. A passage from a homily of Pope Gregory the Seventh, Gregory the Great, sorry, states that the apostolic action the apostles carried out in life through the word was continued after their death by the miracles they worked. And given that this homily was selected for the cathedral of Santiago, for the liturgy in Santiago, it was deemed appropriate to incorporate a short interpolation. The miracles that the apostles work close to their tombs, which is not in the homily of Gregory the Great. Miracles that attracted pilgrims to Compostela. So a collection of miracles was added to show how the apostolic action of Santiago continued after his death and were added to these liturgical materials. We should not forget that in this first collection it was not possible to mention the early medieval tradition of St. James preaching in Spain and the West as Pope Gregory VII had strongly objected to it. For Gregory VII, all Western European churches were exclusively Roman in their origin. Finally, by incorporating the commemoration of the translation of the body of St. James on the 30th of December, an old letter about the circumstances in which St. James' body had been brought to Galicia was also incorporated, incorporated into the collection. Short, shortly after the imperial coronation of King Alfonso VII in 1135, additions were made to the content. In the Liber, Liber Santi Jacobi, new masses and a new divine office was introduced. New sermons were added to the lectionary, together with a legendary tale of two campaigns by Charlemagne in Spain, attributed to Archbishop Turpin, and the book in which the ways of Santiago to Santiago, the roads to Santiago, and the goal of the pilgrimage were described. These new texts openly state that St. James preached in Spain. The work as a whole was attributed to Pope Callistus II, who had died in 1124. And following the stratagem right to the end, every attempt is made to hide its otherwise obvious origin in Compostela. The goal is clear, to suggest that the see of Compostela should be ranked as a patriarchate of the West. St. James' apostolic activity in Hispania during his life and the apostolic action worked from his tomb in Compostela after his death were the two main arguments used in this occasion. These claims were backed by a pseudo-Pope Callistus 
and also by Charlemagne himself in the story of the pseudo turpin the, the chapter 19. Popes and emperors, could there have been better credential, uh, credentials for Santiago in the 12th century? Mm, the history, the Historia Compostelana, the Tumboa, and the Libes Anti Jacobi, together with mm, several other documents kept in the cathedral archives, are the main written sources to illustrate the history of the Romanesque cathedral in many different aspects. Le concerning the chronology of the building work, the founding sources, the names of the masters, builders, and so on. From the very beginning, we know that uh, a team called the Opera Beati Jacobi, the work of St. James, was set up whose mission was to construct the building and also preserve what was built already. The team was initially led by masters Bernard the Elder and Robert with about 50 stone masons. Administrators, administration work on behalf of the chapter and the bishop was initially done by the treasurer Segeredus and the prior of Canonica Gundesindus. Towards 1128, another treasurer, Bernard, learned the work. He was direct, directly responsible for the writing of the Tumboa, as we have seen. In 1168, we know from one of these documents that Master Mateo took over the work of Santiago, La Obra de Santiago, because King Ferdinand II granted him an annual pension of 100 golden coins. Under his leadership and direction, the lintels of the Portico de la Gloria were put into place in 1188. An important source of the, for the financing of the cathedral was the profits from minting coinage in, at the Santiago Mint. In 1107, King Alfonso VI granted the mint to the cathedral so that the building, the building work could be financed therefrom. Throughout the 12th century, different kings confirmed this same privilege on several occasions. Thanks to Codes Calistinus, we know that pilgrims themselves gathered stones in Galicia at the foot of the Mount of Severeiro, at, uh, at the entrance of Galicia, and took them to Castagnola so that the necessary line for the building of the Church of Santiago could be made. Another details could be added, but it seems appropriate to introduce, after this presentation of the, of this, uh, the different sources, a passage wrote by Maestro Giraldus, Magister Giraldus. You can see here this uh, a representation of the Calistinus of Santiago where uh, the Apostle St. James appears to Charlemagne in Akisgran in Aachen. Uh, and since the, the manuscript was copied uh, several times in the 14th century, we have a more varied uh, iconographic repertory than in Tumboa or in Historia Compostelana. This is uh, the, money, the copy of the British Library, the same scene, the same scene in the Vatican uh, archive. Here is uh, Charlemagne uh, and his army uh, going out from Akisgan to Spain, the same scene in another manuscript, the Vatican Library. And this is the Calistino de Salamanca, a, a copy made also in Compostela, where we see a combination of both scenes, the initial of Turpinus, the, the, the Archbishop of uh, Reigns, supposedly the other of, of this narrative. Um, we can see here in Calistino of Salamanca the bishop celebrating mass and, and the, those who had um, 
uh, following the battle of Roncesvalles while he's going to the to heaven this kind of uh, crusade ideal at this time and the final section the final image in Salamanca which, which is not in other in any other copies the Santiago as Miles Christi and these details I was going to talk to you uh, written by Ma Maestro Giraldo in the Historia Compostelana it's the story about the, how Bishop Helmirez and the Queen Uraca were besieged and persecuted during the re revolt in 1116 um, because it's um, the way to understand how this big new cathedral was set in the center of Santiago, in the urban landscape of the early medieval city, such a huge structure, and how it affected buildings that were there before, and how the new building, the new Romanesque cathedral, related to them. At this point, the cathedral was set in fire. The citizens in Santiago attacked the Episcopal Palace. This is part of the work that we've done in UCLA, in, in the lab, uh, as John Dagenet said, trying to organize the ideas. Uh, the new cathedral, the new cathedral uh, went, you can see the first wall of Santiago here, uh, was too big to fit in, inside it, on the south side. And here you can see this uh, city plan to show how the, the revolt in the cathedral gives us a very clear uh, idea of what, go, what, go is, what was, was going on at this point. The bishop and the queen went into the cathedral from the palace, that should be this one here, went into the cathedral then under construction to refuge in a bell tower, which probably was this one here. And the attackers' operation at the base of the tower are described, how they tried to set fire to the inside and how they tried to cut off the, the tower exit from the tribune. The queen, who was deprived from her clothes, managed to escape and cross the, uh, across the inside of the cathedral, first to the church of Compostela, and then to that of San Martin Pinario. She went through to the Corticella, and then to San Martin Pinario, there at the moment. The bishop also reached the Corticella, from this, this second tower, the palace was here, to the Corticella, and he went from uh, this corticella through across the roofs he was able to reach these houses here and he went from one house to another breaking down the fragile wooden partitions until, uh, until he finally reached the monastery church of Ante Altares which at the moment uh, should be here and there he remained hidden until he fled through the monastery cloister which we suppose should be somewhere around there. From the chapel of St. Peter, this one here, he went into the canonica. At night, he left the canonica and went into the square in front of the south door of the cathedral, right here, through the house of a canon of the cathedral. He managed to get out of this first wall of the city and finally left the city through the Porta Faseia in the second wall and fled to Iria. In this story, which is worth of a screenplay, we can appreciate to what extent the new, new Romanesque cathedral had renovated the city center. Uh, as well, all these written sources tell us and present uh, the focus directly on the cathedral itself. 
main, some points as, as the symbolism of the cathedral as well. We know about the, this detailed description of the book five of the cathedral. Mm, never before in the Middle Ages had a building been described with such a sensitivity and such a detail. And the, the cathedral is described as the, the symbolic center of the town of Compostela itself. The city walls, uh, its seven gates are mentioned. The churches inside them briefly listed only to immediately state that in the middle of these churches shines the glorious church of Santiago. It is also worth noting that Book 5 provides another interesting approach to the house of St. James. The description of the altars is like a small pilgrimage that ends up with a detailed description of the main altar which stands over the tomb of Santiago. Something similar had been done in previous chapters when describing the pilgrim's road to Santiago as a journey punctuated by a series of shrines and holy bodies that the pilgrim must visit before reaching the final goal, which is the apostolic shrine. Compostela is described in this hill of Turpin as the place holding up primacy or primacy over the rest of the Hispanic Episcopal Seas. Let me conclude. The Romanesque cathedral is best understood with the help of written sources, but it is equally true that the written sources and the realities that they describe are best understood through the presence of the Romanesque cathedral which thus becomes an extraordinary source of information to reinterpret the documents and the city itself. This virtual reconstruction done at UCLA under the direction of Professor Dallene is therefore for me an invaluable tool for research in the medieval city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Um, we're going to uh, pick up our journey where we left off. Uh, let's, let's go down to the, the altar area and, and look back through the choir, just about where we were. This is one of the nice things you can do. You can fly around the city, go through walls if you want, um, go through the floor if you want. That's what I usually end up doing when I'm trying to run this. Um, so. Uh, we're going to go and look at the west facade. This is, a, this is the area that was probably, uh, m much of it was done under Master Matthew that um, Fernando just mentioned, who took over the work of the, uh, let's, let's stop there and look down the nave and kind of do the wireframe so people can get a feeling for what, what lies beneath. Yeah. So these are the um, pieces that are laboriously put in place. And then uh, textures are put, are sort of pasted onto these to give the feeling of the stone itself. And, uh, but every uh, base and capital of columns and uh, all of those are polygons that then are brought to life through textures. We're, we're just walking by the choir now, and, and of course there were really two churches here. There was the church in the center that was for the canons, for the people. Uh, celebrating the offices of the church. And then there was this aisle and all the other aisles that allowed pilgrims to circulate around uh, to drop off their offerings uh, without interrupting the services that were going on. And that's one of the, the characteristic of this and other churches that are sometimes called pilgrimage churches. They have this uh, uh, design so that people can move around the cathedral uh, to go to all parts of it without disturbing what might be happening in the main altar. We're, go we're going out the West End, and, if, and I think most of you probably know, this is a statue uh, believed to be of Master Matthew himself, his way of signing his work, looking back towards the altar of St. James. Uh, and you probably know rituals associated with this. You bump your head three times here on his forehead, and you can see it's a little shiny there. Uh, in order to uh, have hope some of his genius will rub off on you. 
And around exam time, you can see mothers with kids, you know. Uh, the, uh, let's take a look at the column very quickly. Uh, there's the Portico de la Gloria and the sculpture program here is really the jewel of the Romanesque uh, sculptural pro uh, program that we see here and was uh, constructed under M Master Matthew. We'll take a look at it from a distance, but uh, I want to show you also if we can slide down that column. Uh, those of you who have been there will have seen the let's, uh, hand that uh, where pe uh, people who come to the cathedral place their hand there, and over the centuries, this piece has been worn away in the shape of a human hand. And for me, that's, that's one of the most moving things uh, about coming to this church. And uh, you can really see the 800 years of the Romanesque church in that column. We are going to fly out uh, onto the west part of the city. One of the most, I think, really, one of those things where you, you, you see something that you hadn't seen before through the use of this model, that this model has a, allowed us, let's just fly, I'm, let's just fly, has allowed us, there we go, has allowed us to, to understand this sculptural program because uh, as you remember, uh, let's, let's also bring up the picture of the current facade as just a reminder. The, the Baroque facade is closed in the middle and so that if you want to see the, the Portico de la Gloria, you have to, there you see it on the right, you have to stand in a rather narrow space and crane your neck, and it's very difficult to appreciate that work of art into which uh, so much uh, thought and genius went. When we, and the, when we see it here, though, we can see how, let's stop right there for a sec, uh, we can see how the program, the central tympanum, is actually framed by the arch, which was open, which was not closed, and was really a part of the entire conception of how the Portico de la Gloria would work. Uh, you can see the, the figure of Christ there sort of soaring above the west side of the town. And that, that was the theme of this particular um, sculptural program, the apocalypse, Christ at the end of the world, and a very nice pun in that Galicia, Santiago de Compostela was really at the physical, geographical end of uh, Europe at that time and uh, sort of Christ at the end of time, at the end of the world, uh, re reinforcing that message. And here you can see, get a real feeling for Christ in the apocalypse appearing, uh, soaring above the earth. And this is just one of the things that, that really captured us when we, we, we first looked at that. We're gonna stop here, and uh, John is gonna talk a little more about that aspect of our work, I believe, and show us some of the earlier stages. So, thank you. Thank you. To continue our amazing tour of this monument, uh, Professor John Williams, uh, a distinguished service professor of art and architecture at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Emeritus, uh, will introduce aspects of the uh, reconstruction of the medieval Compostello. And uh, he, he wears many different hats also. Uh, he also is one of the great masters of uh, medieval manuscripts of the illustrated Bayadas, and you know his work. Uh, this is just one dimension of his lifelong love and interest of medieval Spain. John. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck, and all of those who have made this possible, uh, because it never have quite performed before in, in really such a splendid setting. The present, the actual cathedral of, of uh, St. James is the third of the churches that were built to honor the tomb of St. James. And I'm going, I've, thanks to the generosity of John Dajane, I've been allowed to indulge my interest in reconstructing the earlier churches. So I'm going to begin with a view at that reconstruction before coming to the actual cathedral. The Cathedral of Santiago is one of the great churches of Western Christendom. Despite efforts to modernize 
this wonder by installing in the 18th century new facades for the northern or pilgrim's entrance and a great frontispiece for the principal western face. The cathedral remains one of the showpieces of the style we call Romanesque. The Galician spirit behind this monument has far from disappeared. In fact, we would not be here today were it not for the continuation. But in terms of architecture, it required incremental steps to arrive at this celebration of the tomb of St. James. For the tomb was the heart of the enterprise. It obviously determined, as we shall see, the location and orientation of the churches built on the site. Its history, however, is a checkered one. It disappeared from sight for almost eight centuries, the tomb, until around 830, angels led a hermit, Elayo, to a bushy hillock that covered it. It would be lost again for another 800 years until the canon, Lopez Ferrero, was commissioned by his archbishop to search beneath the cathedral. He, Lopez Ferrero was successful. In 1879, he discovered beneath the high altar the basement story of a structure which was identified <clears throat> with the original tomb that the disciples of James had erected in the first century. The pilgrim who seeks the tomb of St. James today descends stairs that lead down from the ambulatory to the crypt below the high altar where the relics of James lie in a large gilt silver chest. The logical and accommodating nature of this crypt challenges one to remember it was entirely the invention of Canon Antonio Lopez Ferrero. In 1077, the design of the new cathedral required adjustments to the tenancy of the grounds around the tomb. This document, recording the outcome, includes not only the first and only account of the discovery of the tomb, more or less in 830, but also the way in which the humble tomb in the middle of nowhere was converted into the locus sanctus. Pelayo, a hermit first led to the tomb, informed the local bishop who relayed the remarkable news to the Asturian king ruling in Oviedo, Alfonso II. He responded in a, matter, in a manner fitting for an apostolic shrine. I quote it, he immediately erected a church in honor of the apostle and near it another in honor of St. John the Baptist, a baptistry we assume, and in front of these very altars raised a third, not modest in size, that contained three altars, one in honor of the Savior, another in honor of St. Peter, and a third to St. John the apostle. In this church he assigned to the abbot Ildifredum, a man of great sanctity, the custody of the apostle, along with no fewer than 12 monks. The dedication of the altars to the Savior, Peter, James, and John, coincides with the roster of the apostles privileged to witness the transfiguration. It is important to note that the cult was entrusted to the monks of San Salvador the ante altares. The excavations of the 50s uncovered the baptistry here. <clears throat> it also confirmed the length of the first church of St. James, the one that would become the cathedral, by finding, I'm sorry, a, a lintel for the uh, entrance way of it. The absence of bases for the columns of an arcade indicated that it did not have an arcade, it was outside aisles. What was not clarified was the manner in which the tomb was accommodated. That is, the excavations didn't proceed to expose very much around this area here. Unfortunately, <coughs> this meant that the important church, the one that was established to serve the cult, was ignored the Church of San Salvador, or as it was called, San Salvador de Antialtares. Now that was the monastic establishment 
and charged with the cult of James. And despite its importance, San Salvador's history faded in competition with that of the church and eventually cathedral of St. James. San Salvador had always, has always, in reconstructions, the few that have been made, been a structure of extraordinary mo modesty. Right, here it is, here. Here's the tomb, St. James Church, the reconstruction by several authors of the Church of Antialtares, despite the fact it was, in a sense, the most important church at this founding. Most strikingly, there's no direct connection with the tomb that these monks were charged with. A more historical reconstruction, therefore, was seen to be necessary, and one that had to assume that Antialtares was one, substantial, in the accord of 1077, termed not modest in size, and two, in communication with the tomb. The church built next to San Salvador around 900, this one, uh, dedicated to Mary today, Santa Maria de Cortitela, display, this is built half a century later than the original church of Antioltare, in a typical style for the time and, and, and the region. That provides one clue as to what it might, the church here might have looked like, because if you add the two original bays, take this, impose it, here, it reaches exactly to the tomb itself. That was one clue in the reconstruction of Antioltares. The second emerges when the Romanesque church of Santiago is compared to four others that lay on the pilgrimage roads and are called, and in a contentious manner for some, uh, the pilgrimage uh, roads school. Only one church in that Santiago has a squared off uh, central apse. Those two clues put together uh, seem to us logical <clears throat> to come up with a, uh, a basis for coming up with a different conception for the church of Antialtares. This. And here's the church of St. James, and they are united over, they're joined openly over the tomb. The reconstruction that results uh, would allow the monks of San Salvador, charged with a custodianship of the tomb, to honor their duties. Of course, they weren't the only ones interested in the tomb of St. James. It attracted foreign pilgrims even in the ninth century, soon after its discovery, and those pilgrims needed an approach to the tomb. The more substantial and extensive foundations recovered in the excavations, and here we have the exterior to, from the rear of Antiotaris. Here we have the combination of the first church of St. James here, the sheltering of the tomb and the church of Antiotaris. And here we have the interior looking from Antiotaris into the church of St. James. Now, as I started to say, the most ex substantial and extensive foundations found here in the excavation of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the 50s was of the church of Alfonso III, the actual foundations for the walls, the foundations of a portico uh, were discovered. The original Iolus church would have been right here, facing uh, Antialtaris in the tomb. It was a three-aisle basilica with a covered porch, dedicated in 899. This church uh, has been reconstructed often from the exterior. We're the first, here it is. Uh, you can notice the reconstructions totally ignore the fact that Antialtares was here with the custodianship of the tomb, which is hidden behind the apse of the, of the cathedral, the first cathedral of uh, of, of St. James. <clears throat> now, one of our reconstruction here, we're in the nave of the Church of uh, 899 and looking into Antiotaris. Now, one detail deserves explanation. 
Asturian architecture employed half circle arches. And as you can see here, we have extended that so that the shape becomes what we call a horseshoe arch. Now, horseshoe arches uh, of a more exaggerated form, uh, horseshoe arches existed in the history of Spanish architecture in the seventh century. But the profile of the arch that we have used <coughs> uh, resembles those of the Mosque of Cordoba, which you see here, and those that were adopted for Christian architecture in the 10th century in what we call Mozarabic architecture that you see here at San Miguel de Escalada, a provincial church uh, built only a decade or so after the Church of St. James. Would a provincial church like this be the first place to introduce this vocabulary that draws on the architecture of Andalusia, the architecture of uh, the Muslims that occupied the southern part of the cathedral, certainly uh, the southern part of the pe peninsula? Or doesn't it make more sense to imagine that an important church, such as the Church of St. James, the largest church uh, in the Christian part of the peninsula at that time, including Catalonia, uh, was the first monument to incorporate such a stylistic detail. Already, by the same king, Alfonso III, details from Andalusia had appeared in churches. Here's one of 893. I'm not sure you can see this, but these are horseshoe arches, and they're in framed. This is a, a motif not found in 7th century Spanish horseshoe arch churches, but in the Mosque of Cordoba. And so this already reflects the incorporation of these, this interest of architecture in Andalusia. The new enterprise, the Romanesque church, begun in 1075, was vastly, as you can see, vastly more ambitious than those previous shrines. Even though the Basilica of 899 was the largest church of its time, the church was definitely underway in 1077 when the Concordia that compensated Ante Altares for the loss of its primitive site here, and the altars there, uh, was signed. Construction was made possible by Alfonso VI of Leon, who offered a good portion of the huge sum he had recently extorted from Abdallah, the Muslim ruler of Granada. As we saw, the plan adopted was that borrowed from French sites along the road. They represented the perfection of a design that facilitated visits by pilgrims to churches that had their own liturgical routines to accomplish while pilgrims were visiting. Hence, large transepts and ample ambulatories and spacious galleries. Here's the one in, in Santiago whose functions aren't specified in the literature, but which must have accommodated pilgrims at times. This pan, a pan to the splendor of the church in the Pilgrim's Guide, written about the Cathedral of Santiago, shows clearly they were accessible. I quote it, whoever visits the naves of the gallery, if he goes up sad, and having seen the perfect beauty of this temple will be made happy and joyful. The church was begun under Diego Pelaez in 1075, as we saw. Diego Gelmiriz, his successor, chose to bury the tomb beneath a splendid and imagined, imaged stage serving the liturgy of worship. And for that reason, it was lost until Lopez Ferreiro recovered it in the 19th century. Included were a new altar with a gilt silver frontal, a meter tall, two meters wide, depicting Christ in majesty, surrounded by the 24 elders of the apocalypse, flanked by 12 apostles. A contemporaneous uh, monument, not an altar, an enormous reliquary, the Arca Santa in Oviedo, can give us some idea of the splendor. Over the altar in Santiago stood an unusual piece of church furniture by Spanish standards, 
but familiar to Gelmirith from visits to Rome, a richly imaged canopy, including angels, prophets, and apostles, the evangelists, the Lamb of God, with the Holy Trinity sculpted in an arcade atop it. According to the Historia Compostelana, this too was of gold and silver. Gelmirith's Capilla Mayor in 1105 assumed the sumptuous appearance it would retain for centuries, even as the tomb disappeared from view. In effect, Gelmirith conceived of his church as a reliquary for the apostolic tomb, and like a reliquary, it wrapped its precious relic in ornamental imagery to a degree that could not have been realistically anticipated. For Gelmiris church was enhanced externally by rich assemblies of sculpture clustered around the principal entries. Gates and portals had been the focal point of this embellishment in various cultures at various times. But in the formation of Christian art and architecture, interiors rather than entries had been the focal point for imagery. A reversal of priority began with Romanesque churches in the 11th century. Gelmiris church was not the first to embed sculpture around doorways, but it was the forefront, in the forefront in exploiting on the exterior of the church the newly revived medium of sculpture as of the vehicle for figures and narratives fundamental to the story of salvation. How did Gelmiris conceive a didactic program of such amplitude? We know and density. We know that he traveled to Rome, to Cluny, to Toulouse, and one assumes to Moissac and Conk. All of these sites would have taught him that any church that sought to command respect and awe would dazzle its visitors through carefully faced masonry and to the revival of a medium long neglected, relief sculpture in a narrative mode. Gilmiris' exploitation of sculpture is <coughs> extraordinary though, for nowhere at the time his, would, his, would portal sculpture, that is around 1100, been exploited to such a degree as would happen under him, at least as far as conventionally accepted dating is concerned. He much admired Cluny, but its facade only timidly advanced in 1100 the use of sculpture in a didactic medium. Moissac's rich facade was not yet up, saint sernin the most accessible of the so-called pilgrimage roads churches, although its south transept door had provided a model for the north door of Santiago, it did not yet offer a comparable assemblage in terms of breadth and complexity, nor did its slightly later door, the Miegeville, although masons from Toulouse went to help Gilmire from Santiago. At Santiago, three coordinated facades teemed with biblical figures, numbering in the dozens. The facade that first greeted the pilgrims, that of the north transept, displayed, as we've seen, episodes fundamental uh, to the need for penance. And we've covered in the 18th figures such as the expulsion, as we've already seen here, uh, there. Uh, can be restored thanks to the pilgrim's guide. And here is that north facade, but we've already seen this uh, earlier. <clears throat> the sculptors of these doorways are French, mainly from Toulouse and, and Caen, but there was a Spanish shop and they produced these brilliant uh, spiral columns in marble on the south facade uh, with the sources including even the Odyssey as far as subject matter is concerned. So when I say a dense, comprehensive program, I'm, it truly was. The south facade faced the city <clears throat> and greeted those who arrived for baptism. The passion, the underpinning of salvation, occupies the right tympanum. The left tympanum is devoted to the temptation of Christ, a positive counterpoint to the negative history of the temptation of Adam and Eve on the north facade. In a daring expansion of traditional iconography, the temptation of Christ on the left here, there he is, here the 
tempting demons there, his sheltering angels behind him. But on the right, erotically conceived uh, animals and a woman seated here with a skull in her lap. <clears throat> now, the Pilgrim's Guide provides a, 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 an explanation of this curious figure on the right of the woman. She's described as an adulteress whose punishment imposed by the husband forces her to kiss the stinking head of her beloved uh, twice a day. Details serve to clench her function as an embodiment of luxuria. She's not fully clothed, merely draped in a robe, arranged so as to reveal a breast and a le bare leg. The luxuriant locks in themselves are suggestive of unrestrained seductive beauty. In Peninsula 12th century statutes, the removal of a woman's coif and the loosening of her hair was an assault on her dignity almost at the level with actual rape. Moreover, she was conceived at a time when a new genre of literature circulated in which sexual freedom and prowess outside the bonds of marriage were being extolled. Those details, stinking head, twice a day, that cannot be communicated by sculpture. It reflects a literate gaze. The spokesman for the new secular culture was William, seventh Count of Poitou, ninth Duke of Aquitaine. He died in 1126. His poems could be extraordinarily bold in the celebration of carnal love. The Tempinum at Santiago may be seen as a clerical counterattack on such literature. Nowhere in his, and oral, passed on orally as well, the Tempinum at Santiago may be seen then as a counterattack, but nowhere in his travels would Gelmirith have found around 1100 such an ambitious program as he designed or one of his canons designed at Santiago. The original west facade of the Romanesque cathedral remains problematic. The Pilgrim's Guide described a western facade as if it towered over the main entrance with sculpture that glorified St. James by displaying the episode most clearly revealed which most clearly revealed his privileged status, the transfiguration, the miracle reported in three of the Gospels. It was witnessed by Peter, James, and John, as we saw. Jesus became radiant, spoke with Moses and Elijah, and was called son by God. It was not widely represented in Romanesque sculpture, but here it was the natural culmination of the celebration of James. In the description of the Pilgrim's Guide, there's, quote, a lo the Lord in a dazzling white cloud, his face shining like the sun, his robe glittering like snow, and the Father above speaking to him, and Moses and Elijah telling him of the end which would take place in Jerusalem. Or, so the Pilgrim's Guide says around 1135, yet its description of the south transept facade The woman with the skull includes the group that we see there today, which has St. James prominently here, and Abraham surging from the tomb, an episode that uh, clerical literature connected with uh, the transfiguration, and a figure of Moses uh, down below. It describes them already as being here. Now, it's difficult to accept this group now on the south facade as uh, being carved for there, but it must have been part of that original program for the transfiguration on the west facade, but not used there because the facade had not risen to that point. Well, that conclusion, which is normal in the literature today, has received a serious challenge from a team of German architectural archaeologists led by Bernd Nikolai and Klaus Wright. And for them, in a stone-by-stone stone, uh, reconstruction of, or, yes, reconstruction of that west facade, this is the interior of the west facade, it rose this high, that is, well beyond the point uh, where necessary in order to have a place to install uh, the sculpture. This is a, a problem that we're working on right now in terms of our reconstruction. If there was a western facade under Gelmirith, who died in 1140, it was, however, sp splendid, however splendid, replaced 50 years after Gelmirith's death in the reign of Fernando II. And we've seen it before 
And I want to close with that same view, this Portico de la Gloria, and there are some actual pilgrims uh, going through this uh, gesture. If there's anything that, uh, single image that justifies what we're doing, I think it is the privilege we have of viewing the Portico de la Gloria as it was conceived by Master Matthew, and which has been denied to pilgrims now for centuries, 500 centuries. Thank you. All right, well, we'll, um, we'll go back. Let's go around the outside just so people can see what the uh, nave looks like, some of the, the uh, buttresses we've reconstructed. And let's go to the south door that John was looking at. One of the things we uh, haven't stressed yet today is the architectural problem of building this now gigantic Romanesque structure on a hillside. The tomb was found near the top of a hill, and as the churches uh, honoring the tomb get bigger, that means that they have to be built out. Uh, if the level is to be maintained, they have to be built out over open uh, space. There has to be uh, something built underneath. And so the west and the south that are on the slope of the hill have to have special adaptations. You saw the, the stairway there on the west facade. We've, uh, on the south door, We've looked at a couple solutions, and ours, um, let's get square on and kind of back, back out. Um, we have uh, felt that perhaps they began already adjusting for height uh, at the end of the transept, uh, before they went through the door. And so one of the things that's, that's made us try out this particular reconstruction is that column that I showed you before, that mysterious column that sits under the door column, under the bases of those columns, we can today see the beginning of another column. Um, and uh, we haven't been able to get under, under there to see if, our, if there really are the remains of columns, but we felt that, well, if there's a, a capital there, what, it, it can't just be to uh, hold up the base of another column, that there might have been more beneath that. And in a way, this is a way of kind of advertising or trumpeting the, the difficulty of building this, this door out over the uh, edge of what was a slope. Uh, so that's, that's our, one of our theories anyway that we're playing with and uh, I, th I just thought it would be interesting to see that and we'll continue our tour after uh, Jose speaks. continue our tour with uh, uh, a presentation of Jose Suarez Otero, uh, who's a technical uh, associate for the Acabeo and I'm one of the key archaeologists for the site at Santiago de Compostelo, and he will uh, bring forth the, uh, how the plan really works archaeologically. Jose. Thank you very much, Charles. And I will try mm, don't destroy too much the, and the English, your language. <laughs> Any study of archaeology at uh, Santiago Cathedral means not only uh, coming to know the evolution of this cathedral sanctuary, but must also approach its very raison d'etre as the cathedral's origins lie in, a, in an event that is in it itself most archaeological, the discovery of an ancient tomb, tomb. This intimate union between cathedral and, and archaeology has meant that the relationship between the two is the basis of a lengthy and complex history which we, we, which, uh, we will be examining in the following minutes. Two events will be seen uh, to be determining factors over the course 
of our reflection. The first, as it's obvious, was the aforementioned discovery of the tomb at some point during the first third of the ninth century. The seventh, of which our knowledge is largely thanks to a series of written documents or chronicles dating from the high medieval period, consisted of the finding of a tomb which was, which, uh, was remarkable, remarkable for its characteristics and which formed a part of uh, the ruins which in early times had represented an expression of life in inland Galicia before being abandoned and hiding at the time of discovery by overgrown vegetation. This tomb was This tomb was uh, deemed to contain the relics of the Apostle uh, St. James, a view which, once it had been officially accepted, resulted in the sudden growth uh, in the veneration of the saint known in Spain as Santiago, with uh, an accompanying architectural expression in which the Apostle Mausoleum would be a determining factor. This was the first period in which St. James' tomb played a fundamental role in the existence and growth in apostolic devotion, as well as being a time in which the respect for the tomb as a monument and the reuse or recycling of the aforementioned ruins served as a nexus with the preceding world. The second key event was the second concealment of the tomb. This time, however, it would, uh, it would not be left to the ravages of nature, but become a genuine, a genuine sanctuary in which the apostle could be worshipped. Here, we refer to the intervention of Diego Helmírez in the early 12th century which within his concept of a new Romanesque sanctuary would eliminate the first architectural structures in which the tomb still played a key role, destroy the upper part of the mausoleum and definitively, and the, and definitively hit the lower part containing the same relics below the new chancel. Thus, the new sanctuary, as a depository of, the, of these relics, replaced the mausoleum as the point of reference for, uh, for worship. The protests of the cathedral chapter at the change that were taking place, uh, excuse me, the protests of the uh, cathedral chapter at the change that were taking place served as a traumatic testimony of this substitu uh, substitution. The dimensions of the new temple also meant the elimination of a large part of the medieval cathedral, and with it, the remains which were still visible of the primitive archaeological context of the tomb. The results of uh, Jalmira's intervention heralded a long period in which the Apostle tomb, from an architectural perspective, this to be uh, an immediate point of reference for the faith. The loss of all the surrounding high medieval structures also mean the disappearance of all, possi uh, of all, of all possible links with the, materia with the material realities of bygone times. However, despite this rupture, uh, the, this rupture with the archaeological past in virtual uh, all senses, archaeology nevertheless was still very much present throughout its constant emergency within the context of Santiago de Compostela. The best known, uh, the best known example is the Romanesque uh, gravestones around the cathedral, referred to an odeporic literature from the 16th century. It, it ought also remain evident in the constant desire for knowledge of the tomb and its original context, 
which between the uh, 17th and 19th centuries saw the publication of historical studies by Osea, Bugarin, Castellà, and Foglio, among others. These writers obviously lacked contact with the material reality of the, of the, of the object of their studies. In the words of Fray Joseph Bugarin, what was once evident is now merely affection, faith rather than human. However, this, uh, these consequences would become more serious with the emergence of a series uh, of uh, mystifications concerning the tomb and what was uh, supposedly concealed in the cathedral sus, uh, subsoil. The building filled with tunnels and, and, passenger way, and passenger ways and the tomb's reality was magnified by what was known a wall subterranean cathedral. A vision that uh, went beyond the popular philosophy became a further element, another point of reference in public, in public worship. It was in this context that in the late 19th century, 19th century the uh, decision was taken to search for the relics and, if possible, recover the, uh, the original tomb and all the uh, related remains of historical interest. The first step, Lopez Ferreiro and the first archaeological reflections on the tomb. We don't know the immediate reasons behind the plan of action put forward by Cardinal Paya and Rico uh, and seconded by, and seconded by uh, two canons of the cathedral, Lopez Ferreiro and Lavin Cabello, who also implemented the plan between uh, 1878 and 1879. Nevertheless, the action taken was uh, noteworthy, both in terms of the, the site that existed at uh, the time to recuperate the physical presence the relics and the tomb among uh, significant people within the Catholic, uh, the Catholic hier uh, hierarchy, as well as the, re uh, as the renewed uh, interest in attaining a comprehensive knowledge of the Bible and the historical context of the church evolution. In 1883, the Vatican archive was open to researches, for example. This was evident in the application of archaeological met methodology. The French Archaeological School Foundation in Roma, the intensification of archaeological excavations and the role uh, played by the Jerusalem Biblical School, and so on. This design was uh, mirrored by growth in a scientific and care uh, at the time and the extensive spread of positivism as a paradigm with a surge in interest in historical studies. This could be seen in Santiago in their scientific interest in identifying, in identifying uh, the relics. However, it should, uh, it should come uh, as no surprise that the starting point in the search for St. James' tomb was the fantastical reality that centuries of concealment had created and thus the first work that was undertaken so to discover the entrance to the supposed subterranean, subterranean structures. But the final intervention focused on a number of flagstones below the altar, the main altar. Once, uh, once raised the remains of a primitive aedicula used as a, bur as a burial city. It did not reveal, however, a subterranean architecture, but instead a number of ancient uh, silted up structures, which indicated the remains of a mosaic floor with another had ceramic tiles. This finds seem to define the level of transit between the two parts on which a, a quadrangular building will have been raised. 
hardly any evidence remains of this higher building of the indication that it was also fragmented horizontally in two parts, separated by a transversal wall, as well as the true nature of the flooring. As far as the uh, inferior is concerned, the quadrangular, the quadrangular layout has been identified, also divided in two parts through the, project, the projection of the, of the aforementioned transversal wall. Here, however, it is closed off on three sides, creating an abseil around the building. The interior of all this architecture was full of layers of rubble, except in two rectangular brick niches about, about uh, the walls on the western side. This complex structure, which uh, we shall not describe in greater depth uh, as no detailed information is available, served as an architectural taster for the apostolic crypt under the chancel, which a current allows access to the saint's tomb and worship of the relics. At the, after this uh, first intervention, there was a wait of over half a century before archaeological work would uh, once again be seen in the cathedral. In the, in the 1940s, they returned as a result of the decision that was taken to remove the Renaissance wooden choir, which, occup uh, which occupied the first section of the main nave of the cathedral. This intervention, uh, this intervention meant that work needed to be done on the floor, which had to be relayed giving Manuel Chamoso, chief supervisor of the works, another chance to, ac to, ac to access the cathedral's archaeological register. Thus, using a small initial proofs which strived up um, great expectations, a long process began in 1946, which would culminate in the excavation of practically the whole of the, basilica, uh, the basilica's subsoil. The new dimensions and the consequent plurality of the affected spaces would, uh, res would result in new content in addition to a, me a methodology which, despite its limitations, was more in harmony with the entity with entity and the characteristics of the research. This was uh, not so much an attempt to respond to a problem of possibly asserting a belief in terms of the, vi the various hist historical enigma surround the phenomena of St. James, even in such cases where the desired response also meant further backing to what was a question of faith. It, it, will, uh, it will, therefore, not be the exclusive problem of the tomb and its relics, but the whole history of the sanctuary and the possible precedents, which at that point, uh, at that point uh, revealed itself through a complex collection of remains and the associated material culture. López Ferreiro's intervention confirmed the, the existence of the saint's uh, mausoleum and the relics, whilst Manuel Chamoso Lama's excavations corroborated the information contained in the archives, having removed the veils which uh, arising from doubts uh, concerning textual criticism or the possible legendary nature of some of the, of the information, this guys, uh, the veracity of a sizable part of the events are retold.
the fruit of this intervention was, abund was uh, abundant and not exempt from the complexity of its uh, comprehension. Nevertheless, as was the case in the first episode, episode, the written records are somewhat insufficient due to the fact that uh, whilst there are numerous, uh, numerous publications, there is no definitive record providing exhaustive, exhaustive information of the work undertaken and its results. The long-term consequence of this was that the findings had less impact than might otherwise have been, the, have been the case, considering the magnitude of the discovery, a situation which was in part uh, ele uh, elevated through the work of José Guerra Campos. This uh, should, uh, shouldn't, however, demonize the importance, the importance of the excavations, which are fundamental in understanding the history of the cult of the apostle in Compostela. Nor should it uh, be forgotten that a good part of the most significant results have already been incorporated into the research into the origins, the origins of this cult uh, and of medieval Compostela. The, archeolo the archaeological activities extended to the surroundings of the Basilica, excavated throughout the 1960s under uh, the direction of Manuel Chamoso. The Plaza de la Quintana was one uh, of the first objectives, as can be seen from the excavation work under the grey fly of the steps, with proofs sent down in front of the Puerta Real, or the, the brief overseeing of work on the access to the adjo uh, adjoining Plaza Platerias. Unfortunately, information concerning this work is scarce and, generally speaking, undated. Uh, and direct. The last works. The final period can be characterized by the prolongation of sporadic interventions, no are clearly determined by work of an architectural nature, meaning that it didn't respond to more strictly archaeological interests, but uh, to the more pressing needs of the building. Excavation work began on the western and southern sections of the cloisters, the parts, uh, the parts which were previously known as the Bucheria, which needed restoration work to prepare them for use during the commemoration of the eighth uh, centenary of the Portico de la Gloria. Little is known uh, of these excavations, which uh, dug into the part of the cathedral which is now occupied by the Renaissance cloister. The use of space went uh, from being storage, uh, storage rooms to being reduced to rubble. The building of the cloister and the medieval wall, which is low, uh, which is late medieval or urban structures. And so we come to the final archaeological intervention in the cathedral. Once again, this took place within the cloisters, albeit uh, with different dimensions and implications. Although this uh, initially arose, arose uh, as the result of another architectural intervention on the drainage, on the drainage of this part of the cathedral, it soon, be, it, uh, soon began, began to be considered a strictly archaeological operation, which meant the total excavation of the cloister patio. In reality, the only thing that was achieved was an initial proof which was required given the extent of the archaeological intervention within an, 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 an familiar framework. This work was undertaken between September 1991 and February, and February 1992, and once again provided important information concerning the building process of the cloister, the early uh, urban world, as well as cultural remains and, see, and signs of the medieval cloister in the shape of fragments of its architectural decoration and the foundation on which it had been built. 
The innovative, uh, innovative nature of this intervention didn't stem from its results, which in general were reflected in episodes and structures from the history of the cathedral, which previous interventions had uh, accepted, although in some cases they had redefined, uh, redefined the realities of Santiago past. This new intervention concerned the definitive, uh, definitive uh, adjustment of the cathedral's archaeology to the discipline current methodological parameters, and above all, uh, the final uh, reivindication of its rule within the context of cathedral research. The independence of archaeology from the disciplines, uh, uh, disciplines of history and history of art allows for greater rigor in the reading and interpretation of the excavated material remains, opening up uh, the possibility of examining subject matter and aspects which, for a variety of reasons, are beyond the scope of other historiographic contexts. It can now be definitively recuperate in order that uh, we might better understand our past and the material reality which corresponded to the construction of building uh, of day-to-day uh, -day life in medieval Santiago and the extended existence of pilgrimage through culture in the broadest sense of the word or the complex dialogue between cathedral buildings and the surrounding urban framework. Thank you. Can we show the, the uh, current facade beside this? And yeah, I did want to point out to you the, the piece that I was talking about that we can still see. Whoops, we can't. But there's a little, little boy standing in front of it uh, in that picture. Um, right here is, that, uh, is this uh, capital that I was talking about. So you can see um, its position in the current uh, stairway. Okay, thanks. Let's move on inside. I'll take a take a look at the altar area that uh, people have been discussing a little bit. Um, as as has been said, the the pilgrims who came to St. James in the 12th century would have been uh, disappointed, perhaps, that they could not actually access the the relics of uh, St. James. They were closed off by Helmides. And let's, let's just go up to the uh, Confessio and to the, that area. They were closed off, and uh, probably it was wise because um, people were interested, including Calmires, uh, people were interested in removing relics and taking them to other places so that uh, perhaps it was a defensive move as well. In any case, uh, the altar, which sat directly above the tomb, became the focus of the cult of St. James, and as has been said, the actual tomb itself remained hidden until, until relatively recently. Hermiras did build what's uh, called a confessio here behind the main altar. This was a place where it was said that people, pilgrims could come to hear the pilgrim mass. The altar that we see when we turn around here is actually dedicated to uh, Mary Magdalene. But we've, uh, here was perhaps the place, uh, the closest point to which pilgrims could actually come into contact with the tomb, which would be just right on the other side of that wall. I think we'll just sort of rise, sort of majestically rise up vertically here and take a look at the uh, Triforium, the gallery that uh, several people have talked about. Uh, not only could you walk all the way around the cathedral through the um, uh, ambulatory and the side nays, but you could also walk all the way around it in the gallery. It's, uh, it's an extensive uh, place, which has been said, where pilgrims might have, uh, have uh, been, uh, been accommodated from time to time. There were also other altars up here. Um, let's take a look then down, down the nave. Or just, okay, we'll amble a little. We'll amble.
so you can see through to the gallery on the other side. All right, let's go, let's go back to the center and kind of uh, look down the nave and get a, a, general, a general view. So this might have been one of the uh, favorite views. It's certainly one of mine of people coming to see the uh, shrine of St. James in the 12th century. Uh, John has already uh, used this quote, but it's such a beautiful quote, I think it, it can be repeated. Here we are in the uh, Triforium above the church looking down, and uh, the Pilgrim's Guide tells us, he who walks through the aisles of the Triforium above, if he ascended in a sad mood, having seen the superior beauty of this temple, will leave happy and contented. And I hope that's the way you leave today as well. We'll have time for questions. I'm not kicking you out right now. So thank you. <laughs>